record at least this piece. All right, so we're recording now. Um, so the clinical interview, this is the first thing you do when you are meeting a client for the first time. And sometimes this is gonna be kind of specific, depending, so like when we were doing our interviews for patients we were going to do neuropsychological assessments on, which is what we'll talk about Tuesday. We'll have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Peg Jensen, who specializes in doing these. Um, but when we were learning, when we would do those when I, in my training program, they actually had them fill out a lot of paperwork beforehand and our intake interview was entirely going through that to get clarification. If I were to sit down with a therapy client, my intake interview would be much more involved and would definitely fit with um, the form that y'all will use when we ever we get to the practice for the intake interview. All right, so in the therapy in general, and in particular in the intake interview, because it's your first meeting with the client, right? It's your first interaction with these folks. Um, the interviewer and interviewer skills are really important. And in particular, we haven't really gotten a chance to talk about this yet, but the most important thing in therapy, now we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of different types of therapies throughout the semester. The most important thing that determines whether or not a therapy will succeed, no matter what type it is, is the relationship between the client and the therapist. So you start establishing that from the interview, and that's really important. I think it accounts for something like 60% of the change that it happens in therapy. So that's really important. So the interviewer should have some skills, right? And in fact, in grad school, in addition to doing a practicum in like basic clinical skills, we had a whole semester of practicum just on assessment, learning how to give an interview, learning how to give other assessments, things along those lines. And this was before we were seeing clients, we would just practice on each other or unwitting members of our friends and family. So like my husband had to take the whole um, intelligence test, <laughs> which is, I still hold over him 16 years later. And he'll be like, oh, I'm stupid. I'm like, no, your waist said you're not. And he's just like, oh, are you ever gonna let that go? Nope, it's in a drawer in my office. I can show it to you again. <laughs> um, so a big thing that interviewers have to do is not get too excited, right? They can be too overbearing, you can kind of scare a client off. You obviously want to be not like sleepy, unenthused, but your job during an interview is mostly to listen. Um, being self-aware, being aware of your own behaviors, things like, am I coming off standoff? Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, <laughs> no, that was a hand up. Oh, good. So things like, you know, if I sit all like crossed up like this, right? I look really defensive and like I kind of don't care what to say. But if I'm able to kind of like sit forward and listen, right? This becomes really hard reading the interview because you do have to take notes. And so one of the things you learn is how not to make that a barrier between you and the client, right? So trying to like rest it on your lap, maybe. So you still have that open communication. And just trying to, again, from the get-go, establish those positive working relationships with clients. Now, depending on what they're bringing to the room and how they're reacting to you, this can be a challenge. So example, again, when I was on my residency, I saw a client who had just gotten in and established with one of our older psychiatrists and really had this like transference where she saw this psychiatrist as like a mother figure. And the psychiatrist had been diagnosed with breast cancer and had to give up all her therapy clients. And so I was assigned this woman. And so she comes in and this is me 12 years ago. So I'm like 28. Um, <laughs> and she obviously can't establish that same type of relationship, right? So she was very defensive. And so it took a lot, and she was like, why do I have to tell everything again? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to hear it in your own words. And did it have to do a lot of work on getting her comfortable. She ended up being one of my like 
clients that made the most progress and like we ended up having a really strong therapeutic bond, but it was not easy, right? Because I had to really prove myself, honestly. Sometimes if you're young or let's say a client comes to me who's a different race than I am, different sexual orientation, I might have to prove to them that I'm competent to, tra to treat them, right? And that's okay. And it's also okay to fire your therapist if you don't feel like they're competent to treat you, right? And actually ethical obligation as a therapist, if you feel like you get someone who has, let's say a disorder you've never treated before, you should refer them. You shouldn't be like, oh, fun experiment case. You should give them to someone who can actually help that person. Um, okay, so behaviors, I mentioned, you know, having open body, eye contact is a big thing, but not like creepy eye contact, right? Not like the whole time, you know, appropriate eye contact. Um, facing the client, appearing attentive. This is really hard when you're anxious when you first start out, not like fidgeting, right? Trying to calm your own body and displaying appropriate facial expressions. Um, I was a guest speaker in Dr. Stoley's class on a Tuesday afternoon. And one of the things I talked about is like, when I was treating Edis or clients, they might tell you something like, yeah, I binged on two sticks of butter and a whole box of cereal. And I can't be like, ew, right? Or if they tell you, yeah, I binged on stuff out of the trash can. You have to be like, okay. You know, and just really take it in and not be judgmental. And that can be really, really hard, right? Uh, I have since kind of lost this ability, or maybe I just don't hold it back. And um, when I don't have a mask, <laughs> my students have told me like, Dr. Myers, we can read everything on her face. Um, like I remember one time I asked a guest speaker to come to Site 480 to talk about professionalism and presentations. They started talking about what women wear. And I was just like, <laughs> My students were like, we just watched your face the whole time. It was great. Um, yeah. Completely inappropriate. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so you really, these are skills you practice when you go to graduate school. Uh, this is really important. <laughs> Referring to the client by the proper name. Um, so if this client is trans, making sure that you don't dead name them. You don't use that name that they were assigned at birth that no longer applies to them. Um, making sure you pronounce their name properly. If you're not sure how to pronounce it, asking them to pronounce it so that you get it right. Um, asking them if there's a name they prefer to be called, right? So like maybe their name is um, Randolph Robert, but they go by Robbie, right? You would never know that just from looking at the paperwork. That's actually a friend of mine from undergrad. <laughs> so, um, so then you would say, oh, okay, thank you for telling me that. And you would address them as Robbie. Or maybe some of them want to be called Mr. Whoever or Ms. Whoever, and that's fine too, right? Because if you do this inappropriately, it can jeopardize that client's comfort with you. It can make them feel like you don't care. Ooh, let me give you like the worst case scenario of this ever. Not a therapeutic setting, but you know, it's very applicable. So when one of my uncles passed away, uh, they had, the officiant associated with the funeral home do the service. And he used the wrong name the entire time. He did not call him Adam. This was his name. He used like someone else's name. And my cousin, his daughter, had to actually leave the room. She was so upset. Yeah, not therapeutically helpful at all, right? In a scenario where you know people are grieving. Um, yeah, so don't use nicknames or shorten names unless they tell you to right? <laughs> um, for some people, the middle name is part of their name, right? So like some people might go by like, there's a famous psychologist who goes by Tommy Ann, right? She's not Tommy, she's not Ann, she's Tommy Ann. Um, so making sure you get that right. And again, making sure that the client's okay with you addressing them by their first name. A big part of the interview and therapy in general is observing client behaviors. This is why therapy during COVID has been particularly challenging as we talked about previously when we talked about our controversies. You have to try to read all that through a screen right? that might only show you from here up on the person. Usually we're looking at things like are their feet fidgeting, right? 
uh, you know, are there other things going on? Are there scars up and down their arms that might indicate either self-harm or drug use, right? Things along those lines, um, or just that they have a very over-enthusiastic cat, right? <laughs> uh, things. And so that could be really challenging over, you know, the uh, confidential version of Zoom, right? There are lots of different therapeutic video conferencing softwares that are HIPAA compliant. So important decisions can be informed by those behavioral observations. That's sometimes something as simple as they show up to the appointment late because they couldn't find the very clearly and obviously located office. You might not have been thinking about it before, but that might mean, hmm, maybe I'll do a mental status exam on this person and see if I wanna consider some neuropsych testing to see if they've got some memory issues or some spatial issues going on, right? Um, you know, if they are, I have to really get myself in the zone to do this. If they're talking really flat and really slowly, it's almost like it's hard for them to get the words out. That can be an indicator of depression, even if they're not necessarily expressing depression as they're presenting issues. Right, so you need to kind of be aware, aware of that. Oh, another non-verbal uh, that I didn't mention is if they keep avoiding certain questions, you know, you don't want to press too much and drive them away during the intake, but like, let's say every time you bring up drug use, right, they change the subject. Well, that's something you want to circle back around to later, right? Um, so rapport is the biggest thing. You want to get the client at ease. Um, acknowledge that this is weird, right? Particularly if you end up using what's called a structured interview. So structured and inter most interviews we do are unstructured, where you just have some general questions you ask, and then you're asking follow-ups, and it's almost like just a conversation with the client. But there are structured interviews you can use where you have to read like verbatim word for word things, and it can feel really robotic. So whenever I switched in my training clinic from doing the unstructured interview to our structured interview, I would say, okay, now I'm gonna have to ask you questions in a very specific way. And it's gonna feel really weird and robotic, but just stick with me because this is really helpful. And the client would be like, oh, okay. And that would kind of help them. Uh, you'd also follow the client's lead, right? Is the client someone who's just going to really talk and that's not an issue? Um, the one person I've ever seen with narcissistic PD, for example, I just asked him, what brought you in today? And he talked for 45 minutes for that one question. Other people would give me half a sentence and be done. I've been feeling, I don't know, pressed, I guess, you know? And so you follow their lead. Maybe you need to ask more or fewer questions depending on that. And again, this goes back to name use as well. What name do they prefer? Things along those lines. Open-ended questions are really important. You know, if you just ask too many yes, no questions, it allows them to close up. So you wanna ask things like, tell me what brought you in today. What was it like in your family growing up? Instead of being like, how many siblings did you have? Right, the first question allows them to elaborate more. It allows for those spontaneous responses as well. Again, you get more information that way. The responses tend to be relatively long sometimes, and that's good, that's okay. <laughs> that's what you want. Um, but sometimes you don't have details, and that's the nice thing about these uh, unstructured interviews is then you just ask follow-up questions. Oh, really? Like, tell me more about this part. Or, oh, what was happening there? And then this is the sort of what's sometimes called the non-directive interview cell. You don't want it to feel like you're a police officer drooling right, for a crime. You want this to be a conversation that helps you gather enough information to treat them. So the closed-ended question allow for far less elaboration and self-expression. Sometimes you do need to ask those though, uh, because you know maybe there are just yes, no. Like, have you ever been hospitalized? 
That's a yes, no, but you need to know that, right? Um, you get quick and precise answers, and in a very directive interviewing style, this is what you would do. So as I mentioned, clarification questions become very important. You want to make sure you're understanding properly what they're saying. And sometimes you do this in like a reflective listening way. So what I'm hearing you saying is, X, Y, Z, kind of repeat what they just said. Is that what you're trying to say? Or does that sound accurate? You sort of check with them um, and then they can clarify for you. It enhances your ability to get it. <laughs> and it communicates also that you're actively listening, that you're there with them. And sometimes you want to circle back around and have to be like, what do you mean by that? Right? Again, we want to put them at ease. The only time we would use confrontation is if you're noticing just like a lot of inconsistencies. Wait, you just said this, but now you're saying that, right? And for some people in certain situations, let's say this is for a court hearing, right? Maybe this is for custody of their child or they're trying to say they're not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, they have a lot of motivation to maybe not tell the truth, right? And so the, you might see it there. But there are people who just might not have the cognitive wherewithal because of their disorder to actually have their story correct in our mind, right? And so sometimes you just need to use follow-up questions and sometimes Typically, I would not use confrontation until like a therapeutic bond had been established or maybe later in sessions instead of in the intake. Uh, again, unless you're doing this in like a forensic setting where you as the interviewer need to know accurate information or at least how the person presented it. Um, but just like later, you may be like, you know, before you said this, and then you said this contradictory thing. So, you know, I'm just confused. What was going on, right? Or there are really therapeutic ways to do this. So um, my supervisor, when I went on rounds in the hospital, when I was on my placement here, had just like the best demeanor ever. <laughs> he just like had this soothing voice and just, you felt so confident and calm when you were around him. And um, sometimes what he would run into in the hospital setting is people who did have one of those somatic symptom disorders, right? That it was actually psychological issues causing pretty serious physical symptoms, like even things like paralysis on one side, but there's no physiological explanation. And so he told us stories about how he would just, after he'd seen the person for a couple of sessions, he'd sit down with them and be like, you know, sometimes when people are experiencing this, I'll start to feel a change and maybe they'll get like a tingling in their fingers or toes. And then maybe they can start to wiggle them and he'd like go through almost like a whole relaxation <laughs> uh, thing. And then he'd come in maybe a day or two later and they'd be like, that thing you said, it started happening to me. And just like the power of suggestion, basically. So that can be pretty powerful therapeutically. Um, paraphrasing is something you do quite a bit, not only in the interview, but in therapy itself. So what I'm hearing you say is, you know, like, is that correct? Um, and then reflection of feeling. So part of what we do in addition to reflecting what they're saying is things like, it seems like this is really difficult for you to talk about. It seems like maybe you're feeling distressed right now, or I can see that this makes you really sad. Can you tell me a little more about what's going on with you emotionally? And for some clients, they've never realized they're experiencing those emotions at those times, right? So it can be really hard for them to talk about, particularly if they grew up in a household where you just don't talk about that stuff, right? Summarizing can also be really helpful, especially at the end of the interview. Here's everything we've talked about based on that. Here's what I think maybe what should happen. It lets clients know they've been understood in a comprehensive, integrative way. And so our conclusions, again, especially if you're under managed care, 
it will have a specific diagnosis, and then it may involve recommendations. And depending on sort of your philosophy and the requirements placed upon you by insurance companies, your state regulations, what have you, you may or may not choose to share that diagnosis with the client. Sometimes it's just not helpful with also on the diagnosis. It's just, you know, you go in and you treat the symptoms. When I was on my residency in Augusta, Georgia, it's actually state law that you tell the person their diagnosis by the end of the session. And it was really interesting because I was a trainee, it was also state law that I'd have to call my supervisor. They'd come down, we'd powwow in the hall, I'd tell them the diagnosis, and then we'd review it to them together so that the client could put a face to my supervisor, which I thought was kind of nice. Um, but, you know, Again, there are different reasons and different strategies for why that may or may not be helpful. A big, uh, and also specific recommendation. Sometimes there might not actually be helpful for someone, right? Maybe there's something else that would be really helpful. You know, I'm actually gonna refer you to our pain management clinic because that sounds like what would help you the most right now. Um, but sometimes you have specific recommendations. I think that we should do therapy uh, for, you know, this type of therapy. Let's start with 20 sessions and see how it goes. Uh, confidentiality is the biggest, biggest thing. And this is what you explain, honestly, at the start of the interview. I would explain, like, everything between us is confidential. There are some limits to confidentiality. Um, if, you know, I hear anything about child abuse, abuse of an elder, abuse of someone who cannot stand up for themselves, like an adult with developmental delays, I am required by law to report that. And if there are any other extenuating circumstances, if I think you, if I think you are going to be a danger to yourself or someone else, and you aren't agreeing to get further treatment, I may be, to, I may be required to break confidentiality, just so they know. Now, they won't necessarily remember this, right? So if you get to that situation, you'll have to remind them. Um, and then record keeping. You know, there are pros and cons of each. I like taking notes in the moment, but like I said, I could like kind of put a barrier between you. Um, and then you can do audio or visual recordings and then sort of take notes from that later. But Sometimes people act differently when they know they're being recorded, right? And so sort of you have to weigh which is the most helpful. Sometimes you're required to. Let's say you're doing an interview in like a legal setting, you might be required to record it, right? And then you just have to let the client know. So the interview room um, and the therapy room in general, again, you would think like, why does that matter? But it's part of the common factors that make people feel like therapy is therapy. A couple different arrangements. The traditional psychoanalytic arrangement was I would sit here and my client would be on a couch laying down with their head right here. And the idea was they couldn't see me so they could just project anything they were feeling onto me. More traditional, uh, what's used now, you tend to be in chairs or comfy couches facing each other. Um, so that it can feel like you have that connection. Sometimes you'll have like a 90 degree angle as well. The setting should facilitate the fundamental goals. So it should be confidential, right? I'm not gonna do this really involved in take interview in the waiting room, right? Or in the parking lot. Um, again, the room should hopefully be comfortable. Uh, you know, and, and thinking about the types of clients you might work with, right? So like I had a client who would get migraines. And so the therapy room I used for her luckily had a side lamp. And so when she had a migraine, we just used that for the overhead fluorescence. You know, things along those lines. If you're going to work with clients of diverse body sizes, right? Having chairs they can fit in. That's something that when we did the pre-surgical interview for people who were going to think about bariatric surgery, we had to think about do we have chairs that can fit in comfortably, right? They can't be chairs with arms like this, so the person might not be able to fit. So there are like double-sized chairs you can get or just chairs without arms, uh, things along those lines. 
Um, if you are going to have clients who are going to need wheelchairs, walkers, things like that, does your office have enough space for those? If you're going to be specializing in kids therapy, you got to have some toys in there, right? Make it appealing to the kiddos. Um, or if you're expecting parents to need to bring their kids, having something on the side for them. You also should steer clear of overtly personal items. So again, therapists are going to debate about this, but like some therapists won't ever have pictures of their family or at least not oriented so the clients can see them. You want to seem like a person, but not make therapy about you, if that makes sense. All right, so the intake interview is what we've mostly been talking about today. So you're gonna determine whether the client needs treatment and for what, and what form of treatment would be the most helpful. And so it's detailed questioning about that presenting complaint. Sometimes you'll do an additional formal diagnostic interview. And these are where you assign DSM diagnoses to clients' problems. And so like what I ended up doing when I was in those managed care settings is I would just sort of incorporate that into my intake interview. Right. Oh, they have depression. I'm going to ask about the symptoms of depression. Um, but these actual diagnostic interviews are very formal. They essentially take the criteria from the DSM and turn them into questions. And then you ask those questions as yes, no questions. Uh, the structured clinical interview for the DSM or SCID is the most commonly used. So it's a list of questions that ask about specific symptoms of disorders listed in the DSM. Again, they're yes, no. There are modules. So you can, if you ask a screener at a start of a module and they're like, nope, you can skip to the next module. You don't have to ask them about every diagnosis. So that's really nice. There are also more specific interviews for more specific diagnoses. So for example, there's the eating disorders questionnaire uh, or in the sort of examination, sorry, there's both. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's a formal interview with the diagnoses for uh, eating disorders. There is one that I learned called the CAPS, the Clinician Assessment for PTSD Symptoms. And that one, not only do you ask about PTSD symptoms, but you ask about how severe they are and how long they've been going on, how often they happen for each symptom. You can also do a semi-structured interview where you kind of blend the unstructured and the structured. So mental status exam. A lot of times we won't do this formally with most clients. If they show up on time, if they're able to have a conversation with us, we'll say they're oriented for person and place, right? But in medical settings, or if you're gonna be doing a neuropsychological interview, or as I mentioned, if that person just seemed like they might have something going on with memory or orientation or awareness, you would do a formal one. And these are sets of questions like, what day is it? What year? You give them basic memory things to do and have them do really basic tasks. These are brief and flexible administration and it captures the psychological and cognitive processes of what's going on with that person in the moment. These also can serve as like a screen to determine whether we might need to do more intensive neuropsychological assessments like we'll talk about with Dr. Jensen on Tuesday. Um, thinking about cultural things, right? Uh, these are really important things that even if the person is from the US, it's really important to ask, right? Who do you consider family might be really different depending on that person's individual family, right? Family might just be one parent or it might be a rather extended uh, connection of cousins and whatnot, or it might be friends, chosen family, right? Um, talking about languages, religious practices, and what I've mentioned previously, asking the client to identify their cultural practices and what their cultural practices mean to them, rather than like reading it in a textbook and be like, oh, I got it, right? <laughs> um, 
and thinking about their home, their neighborhood, who they go to for help. You know, one of the questions in my typical unstructured interview that I asked was like, who would you go to if you had, if you need help with something? And it's really sad how many people say things like, I don't really have anyone, right? Or they have like one person in their lives. Um, and then what are your goals? I mean, this is something that I would often ask at the end of the interview. Um, one of my friends called this the magic wand question. If I had a magic wand and I could wave it and make things all better, what are three changes you would see, right? And that's kind of fun because then they start thinking like, oh, this could help me. You always ask them if they have any questions. Usually they're too overwhelmed too, but sometimes they have really good questions about what does learn next steps, what does therapy mean? Sometimes they're inappropriate. My first client, I think I told you all the story, my first client I ever saw, I asked him, do you have any questions? He said, yeah, can I have your phone number? And I was just like, ah, because <laughs> I was, you know, 24 and didn't know what I was doing. Um, maybe even 23, uh, young, right? <laughs> And so, yeah, we wanna always make sure we're doing that. Obviously we didn't get to the intake interview today, but that is okay. We will do it probably next Thursday. Um, so if I don't see you, have a great weekend and um, enjoy the weather today. It's gonna be like 70.